This episode of Books du Jour is brought to you by Picnic Market and Cafe. Welcome back to a new episode of Books du Jour. My first guest is a new author called Mike Offit. He wrote a thriller mystery novel called Nothing Personal. It's a coming of age story. My second guest is, uh, is a historian. Uh, his name is Harlow Geil Unger. He wrote a book about George Washington called Mr. President. And finally, my last guest is Judith Glazer. She has a book called Conversational Intelligence and we look at um, conversation among peers, and especially in a society where more and more hierarchies are being flattened. So join me for a new episode of Books to Jour. So why were you drafting a constitution where the president has no power to do whatever he wants? Well, the framers had lived under the tyranny of King George, the autocratic monarch, mm -hmm. King George III of England for many, many years, and they were not about to create uh, King George IV in, in, in their presidency. So they created a figurehead uh, with, and left all the power to the people. That's why the Constitution begins, we the people. And that meant the House of Representatives, which was the only governmental body that was directly elected by the people. I was actually very surprised to find out that only five wars had been backed up by uh, Congress, as all the wars had been. Uh, Indeed, uh, and in Congress has only declared war five times, and well, the United States has been in, in more than a dozen full-scale wars. Uh, and uh, dozens and dozens of, of little operations, Operation black ops there, as yeah, they yeah. call them, where we've sent troops overseas. Yeah. The president doesn't have the right to do this. Mm -hmm. Only Congress can declare war under the Constitution. So why isn't there like an article in the Constitution that prevents presidents from doing that? Well, they, they thought they did. Okay. And uh, the, the, the problem now is that all three branches in the course of the centuries have uh, taken turns violating the Constitution. They're in a tug of war for power. It's not the Constitution itself that prevents it, it's the other two branches that pull the, th the third branch back into compliance. Uh, you worked in banking for years. You know, is there like a lot of abuse of power or the dis disregard for the power that be? There's been a, a real connection between the powerful banks and government and mm -hmm. they're, they're called the revolving door. So uh, if bankers don't like rules the way they're written, they've generally had the ability and the power to uh, to get them changed, uh, the greatest um, abuser of that to me uh, was the Se Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, Bob Rubin, who used to run Goldman Sachs, uh, where I worked for several years, um, became Treasury Secretary, and he very much appealed, uh, re resisted uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. But just before he mm. left office, he turned his support to the repeal of Glass-Steagall, and just after he left office, Glass-Steagall was repealed, and um, he went to work almost immediately for Citibank. And Citibank, of course, was the single biggest beneficiary of this, of this um, repeal of Glass-Steagall. I mean, not only did they lose enormous amounts of money, but they were also um, found guilty of all sorts of corruption scandals mm -hmm. all over the world. In banking, the power of money to influence government is almost limitless. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, you know, a repeating cycle over the years. The government has very, bent very much to the will of the bankers. And um, under Bush, uh, even more so, I would say, under Obama, and his positioning vis-a-vis um, -vis the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and how it was dealt with and how the bailout worked, really could have, it was a script that could have been written by the bankers, not by the people what, yeah, I think or, or by responsible government. I'm shocked. So, so, You're uh, shocked. I shocked. think you knew about it. I mean, what would have happened to the, the economy if those banks had failed? It's like any other business that declares bankruptcy. It continues to function just as it did before bankruptcy. Um, when I worked at Goldman Sachs and at Deutsche Bank, we would run leverage of 20, 25 to 1. Mm -hmm. By the time the, the failure came in, uh, in 2008, these banks were levered at as much as 50 to 1. And they had really expanded things beyond any, uh, any yeah. rational or responsible um, mm. level.
big, you mostly work with mostly large, 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 large companies, I, I yeah. And you teach people how to the art conversation. Absolutely. And so, uh, so is it in order to deceive better, or is it to educate better? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at those moments of contact between people, especially mm. when they're in hot situations right. where there's a battle, there's a, a win-lose, and try to figure out how to help them understand how to step out of that moment mm. and figure out more strategically how to manage that interaction so that it feels like there's more space for dialogue. I, this conversation is about you and me talking, mm -hmm. and I want people to understand what's going on in our heads. It's not just the words we use. It's not how smart so, so we are. So have an awareness of your it's being present and talking. And, and yeah. pre being present and also understanding what gets triggered in you because once you're triggered, Trust can disappear in 0 0.07 seconds. But passion is a way of being as well, no? To be yeah. passionate about something. I love passion. Passion yeah. is true. So I can disagree with you. I said, no, you I don't know it. what you're Bring talking about. Bring <laughs> it on. <laughs> Very that's dangerous. That's why I called my book Mr. President, because in quotes, because no one knew what to call him. Mm. He was the first elected president in world history. Yeah. There had never been an elected president. Some people wanted to call that's him right. your elective highness. Oh my no, goodness, no, that was England, right? Finally, <laughs> James Madison, who had uh, one of the authors of the Constitution, reminded everyone that uh, titles were prohibited under the Constitution, yeah. that the president was a citizen like everyone else mm -hmm. and had to be addressed as Mr. President. So let me ask you a question, because once you put a title that's big, that makes someone bigger than life, mm -hmm. it changes how people interact with them, right? There's a certain level of respect. Often there's a holding back. Uh, withholding the, of information because you're afraid. Yeah. Everything is done in a different way once that title is given to someone. Indeed, is that and uh, I, uh, perhaps it's a reflection of my age, but uh, I'm uh, terribly upset at this uh, national habit now. People you've never heard of calling up, calling you by first name. Asking for uh, money, right? Uh, well, even when they're not asking for money, even when they call to repair your telephone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think that is? I What's shifting? I have no idea what it is. It's a, it, 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 it's a form of democratization which depersonalizes yeah. everyone and yeah. disrespects everyone. You're, you're as low as I am. Well, see, I think it's something else that's going on. I think that there's a pushback, especially with the young millennials. They don't like the authority figures. They're not about anything like ego, like we used to be more thinking about. But it's really saying, look, we're equal. Let's start out making it parity. Let's start out so that you and I can talk to each other so it's not about power. You know, it's not power over. I call it power with. It's one of the big how shifts. How about uh, it being about knowledge? You know more than I do, and mm -hmm. I should respect you for your knowledge and your maturity. Well, yeah. So this is what happens in companies, and this is what I study, because people who think they're right, and it's all about how smart I am, get addicted to being right. When that happens in companies, companies become silent, and they don't speak up about the things that are important. But I think you can have respect and the ability to have a voice, and that's mm -hmm. the struggle that my book talks about, okay. is how to include both, how to enable people to have respect for each other, for what they brought to the table, but not allow that to get in the way of having so a So this sounds voice. very great as a theory, but how do you apply that? I mean, so you come into this company at the table, and, you, and, and then what? You increase uh, productivity or management skills, uh, or what, 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 what do you go with that? I go for the big picture. I go for everything because I okay. think once you shift this dynamic about power mm -hmm. and enable leaders to understand how to bring voice in, all of a sudden a company can make more money than they've ever thought of. So when I worked with Clairol and they were just uh, they just left and did their IPO, they were 250 million. They got sold seven years later for 4.5 billion to Procter and Gamble. How did they do that? They changed the whole culture. They create, so it's not just about money, but it okay. sure was about money, right? Well, they, that's, a, that's a driver, isn't it? Was it was a driver. Changing everybody's hair color. I mean, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they changed it from hair dye to hair color, and ah, <laughs> that was their thing. winning formula. Mm. They, they invented an industry that didn't exist before, but the leader, Steve Sadoff, had to enable the communication and conversations to break through any old thinking that existed. I mean, there was no precedent for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I love to do, is create that environment where the ideas that nobody ever thought about before can end up on the table and become the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spent my career working in large corporations, and probably my single greatest failure was uh, ability, my ability to communicate effectively with people above me. Mm -hmm. And as I got more senior in an organization to where I was running a large department, um, in, the cor in most corporate cultures, it's a, it is a, all about success and power and money, and mm -hmm. many times it can be completely decoupled from the performance of the company. Mm -hmm. um, there are, in most organizations, people in power don't really care as much about the overall success of the company as they do about their own success. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really um, you know, the great dichotomy of the corporate culture that, that I had to learn the hard way many times over. You know, it's almost like a Tourette syndrome mm -hmm. for me, or I, I just I, I can't believe it. But people, you'll see people in power make decisions that are contrary to the best interests of the company, but they're very much in their own best interests. 
and I think that um, you know, that resistance to ideas from below um, is really coupled more to resistance for other people getting credit or being recognized for their you know, superior contribution. Mm -hmm. And to overcome that in a, in a large corporate culture is an enormous challenge. So here's a yeah. simple example. I was working with Barclays and a managing director, he was called, the, he was like the, the lightning rod in, on Wall Street. He could get more money into the company than anybody else. So he had an ego and he was rewarded sure. for it. And he went in to run a meeting with his team and he said, it's gonna be about best practices and I'm gonna tell everybody what I've learned about best practices. That's what lawyers, leaders usually say. And then I'll invite people to add their new ideas. Well, I said, to, he always would come to me and play it out before him. I said, if you mm. do that, it's going to be failure. If you do that, you're not going to achieve what you're looking for. Flip it. You put their ideas on the table first and then add and support mm. and so forth. He did it, first time he had ever done it. His boss was sitting in the room. He got promoted again because of that one action. And what she said mm. was, you're reversing what's happening on Wall Street. You're helping us understand that it's the voices that count. We have to bring them in because they're our next generation. We have to cultivate them. We have to develop them. That's mm. what I do is help leaders make, I call them leaderships was something they've always been doing. Telling a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you not tell and ask? They're simple switches that believe me, when they're willing to do my experiment, mm -hmm. which I, that's what I'm known for, <laughs> I call it the experimentor, being a mentor of an experiment, yeah. right? Yeah, under the London Whale. I have Mark, please. Uh -huh. London no, that, was, that was Morgan. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But no, the London Whale was, um, I was a trader over on the London Derivatives desk uh, for JP Morgan. And that was a case where the head of a company, uh, Jamie's very loyal to his people, um, and he trusts people who run departments and divisions for him to, to you know, to be straight and, and perform. And in this case, he made a mistake. He put his mm -hmm. trust in the wrong person, and you know, a small problem developed into a gargantuan one. But that's been a repetitive theme on Wall Street. It's it's the misvaluing of inventory and hiding of losses and, and trying to. To trying to, to go to make to pretend it doesn't exist. Pretend mm -hmm. it doesn't happen, yeah. and it's something I saw throughout my career, yeah. Um, yeah, from the beginning to the end. But um, but that's when you're getting into something really important. These are our biases. When we like someone, we have a bias in favor of them. We mm -hmm. stop seeing all the things that are going around, especially if it's our pet. And then you have a problem that erodes an organization, a culture, because mm -hmm. you is it that they don't see, or that they just don't look. They ignore, and they, they don't ignore see, it. right. They don't want to believe that this person that they have now trusted is going to be doing those kinds of mm. things. So they kind of. But there's only like the human experience based on, on the trust. I mean, you talk a lot about trust. Uh, if repeated uh, um, behavior reinforce trust, so if you have a, a president, you know what he's doing. We, we trust the president, and he can do everything he wants because he doesn't have. We really have to listen. He has convictions. Mm -hmm. He has an experience, and he, he moves forward. Yeah. And I would, right. I would imagine, I mean, for Washington, as for Bush or Obama, I mean, just as, as no head of J.P. Morgan could possibly understand everything that a bank that size is doing. That's I mean, right. Jamie's a, a really bright guy, but how could he possibly understand every yeah. trader's position? How could how could Bush understand the subtleties of military intelligence, or Obama understand the subtleties of banking? They have to well, have those why, trusted lieutenants. Why then do they have the <laughs> to see to seek the office that demands that they do understand so, yeah. Washington Isn't when he became when well, he accepted the presidency he didn't want it we're going by he had been commander in chief of, of the Continental Army organized a bunch of farmers hmm. who defeated the world's strongest best equipped best trained army in the, in the world mm -hmm. so he had ex eight years of exper executive experience running the Continental sure. Army he had uh, seven more years of experience running his, uh, what we'd call an agro-industrial empire at Mount Vernon, a 20,000 acre estate that uh, grew all kinds of grain, tobacco. Well, what was his sure. ego like? Because you're describing somebody who was totally equipped for that role and that it could have been saying, you know, I know all the answers, but I got a sense yeah, that he didn't have that unique same unique ego. And seems unique, unique in history. In his, yeah. Yeah. He, he did and he didn't. What, what he knew was right, he would, when he felt it was right, he would follow mm -hmm. uh, his instincts on that. Uh, but he would consult others with, with more experience. For example, he appointed Thomas Jefferson, much to his regret later on, as Secretary of State, because he had never been overseas. Although he had dealt with the French here, uh, he was very close to Lafayette, very close to all the fr top French officers, had coordinated the French Army's uh, 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 advance with the American Army and the French mm -hmm. fleet coming into Chesapeake Bay. So he had some experience, but he didn't have experience with foreign governments. And Thomas Jefferson did, so he appointed Jefferson 
as his Secretary of State, mm -hmm. yep. and unbeknownst to him, Jefferson starts making deals with French revolutionaries and brings, uh, uh, approves the uh, appointment of a Jacobin <laughs> a radical ambassador. Was that outside of his comfort zone? Uh, yeah, who, <laughs> start, who start, start, tries to start the French Revolution here yeah. in America. Yeah. And that's when uh, Washington had, had to fire Jefferson yeah. right. and, and, and pass the, uh, uh, imposed the neutrality proclamation. Yeah. His approach was to uh, pick people, delegate to them, elect them to do the best they can. Yes. And then until well, they made, you well, know, stepped over the Hamilton line. Hamilton that established, that helped that's establish right. the first. Uh, United States Bank, which was the forerunner of the Federal Reserve System. Yeah. Let's talk about Bitcoin, because it seems like it's going over boundaries and governments as far as being ruled. It's almost like a deregulation. Yeah, deregulation right here. A deregulation of uh, currencies, where the, no one is really in charge. Do you have a sense if it's the next step, the next frontier to be uh, well, to be dealt I, with? I think it's a, I think it's sort of a, a natural um, development from uh, you know, the, the devolution of trust in, in our financial system. As a banker, um, I think Bitcoin makes an enormous amount of sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, it also opens itself up to abuse for the sex trade course, and yes. for and for you know tax evasion or whatever else. But there's no regulation at the moment whatsoever. I think it's the greatest thing since, since tulips. But that's <laughs> are you being sarcastic? <laughs> since tulips. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, but well the, see, the Dutch trade was still tulips, a trade. You know? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, what what value does anything have? People say, well, if a currency is backed by gold, then it has true value. But gold, I mean, you can't eat gold. You can't you can't cook with it. You could make a house out of it, I guess, but it doesn't really have any intrinsic value except for its you know. Relative beauty. Yeah. Um, teeth. But we're so yeah. used to tactile things that we can yeah. touch, right? Oh, the the analog world, yes. I, mean, I, I think, I think that the Bitcoin is, is a great concept. Um, I, I wish that it hadn't been linked to, to um, you know, the drug trade and sex trade as it has been. It would be, be wonderful to see you know, an off-the-grid off the currency mm -hmm. that really you know, did have an internationally recognized value by the citizens as opposed mm -hmm. to governments because it would take an enormous amount of power away from the central banking system. Sure. Which to me, you know, as, a, as a practitioner for 20 years, um, you know, have been completely corrupted mm. and, are, and, are not, and, are, and are not to be trusted. So how do we build trust in something like Bitcoin? Hire Madoff. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great way. Well, talk, I mean, is well, there a tax problem at the end of the day? Well, is there control? Everything is always, is always uh, at least in this country, always comes back to taxes. To taxes, the government, right. you know, We have this enormous government apparatus that, that I'm sure if Washington were to, were to wake up in 2014, he would, he would want to go back to sleep again. He wouldn't have any concept that mm. government could have grown into what mm -hmm. it's become. So I, I do think that um, you, know, uh, you always have the potential for abuse when you have anything of, of value. Yeah. Um, but you have the certainty of abuse when you put power to control these systems into a very sure. small you know, number of hands like we have now in our country. Hello, you talk about uh, the, the Whiskey Rebellion. What, what, what was the trigger for that? Well, it was a tax as well, right? Yes, again, the government was yeah. out of money and uh, we had no uh, income. There were no income taxes, no sales taxes. The only income came from duties on foreign products. So they imposed a 25% tax on whiskey, which was the most a widely consumed beverage in America, uh, and that were people were annoyed by it. But it would have been all right, except for farmers west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, they could not get there. There were no roads across the mountains. They could not get their grain to market it, traveling in bulk. Mm -hmm. There simply was no way across. The, so they distilled it into whiskey, uh, what we call white lightning, which mm -hmm. could be uh, put into jugs and barrels and put on mules and, and carried the yeah. trails over to eastern markets. Well, 25% tax on their whiskey that wiped out all their profits, and they staged a rebellion, which at the time was every American's worst nightmare. Here was Washington uh, putting down rebellion with troops, a tax protest. 30 years later, he led the tax protests against the British government, mm -hmm. and here he was doing the same mm -hmm. thing, except for one thing. The people of the United States were represented in Congress, which passed the tax. We were not represented in Parliament, which the imposed Bush, the yeah. stamp tax. And Washington uh, sent troops to put down the rebellion, saying that if a minority is allowed to dictate to the majority, uh, that's the end 
of uh, our liberties, our security, our property. It's the end of mm -hmm. uh, a Republican form of government. And so he did send the troops across the mountains. The farmers dispersed before the troops even got there. By the time the troops got there, they found 20 drunks <laughs> lying around oh, in the right, forest. They brought them back to Philadelphia, tried them for treason. Uh, 18 of them, were, it were, the charges were dismissed. Uh, the other two were convicted of treason and Washington pardoned them. Uh, th th there was no uh, intent to punish mm. these people. So with all the companies you've worked in, have you ever experienced some sort of uh, internal opposition to, um, to an agenda coming from the top? Um, it happens, and when that happens, then usually a change, if you can't, if you're a large organization, over 100,000, and a lot of people feel the same way, you're not going to change them overnight. The leader doesn't have the time, doesn't have the strategy, mm -hmm. and so it may be time to move them out. Some companies are f famous for call, asking their employees for ideas and then allowing those ideas Correct. to float up the top. Right. The 3M company is, is famous for that, and, and they've gotten so many inventions that's because right. of that. Right. Why don't all, all companies uh, do well, it? Why don't they I, look at these I companies and say, boy, this formula works, why don't we try it? I here? have a prediction. We're at, we're at the turning point. That's why you hear so much about disruptive technologies, companies that are saying we've got to disrupt the old status quo. It's not working. Clearly, the idea of the guy at the top as being a king it no longer exists in the minds of any of the companies that I work with. And I work mm -hmm. with all the Fortune you know, 500 companies. Sure. It's just we're away from that now. So the question is how to create an environment where the ideas can come in and people don't politic their ideas because that's just as bad as uh, having one mm -hmm. person at the top. And when those in environments exist, there's a rich, hearty shift in everything. Do you remember what IBM did a bunch of years ago where they opened up the internet and of course they knew how to do that and they said everybody put your ideas about IBM or what we should become and it was a three day mm -hmm. harvest of new ideas. In the first 57 minutes there were so many people saying bad things about the company they almost <laughs> closed it down. I mean yeah. it was like a chance to get it off your chest. Well, it's also I would, have I, would, yeah, I would have thought people would be distrustful of the system because they say, oh, they're collecting information about me, I'm going to get fired. Right. Uh, it, everything was happening yeah. in the first 57 uh, minutes, but then it shifted, and people started to read the ideas that were good. They shifted. They got over a million data points of new ideas. They made it down to uh, 19 themes that IBM should consider for its future, and they used those themes. It went from product to service, and yeah. IBM's a completely different company. It was completely yeah, well, based the on... The survival of companies like IBM and, and Microsoft in the, in the yeah. face of all the innovation, it's really, I mean, it's a great compliment to how they have, have run those companies, mm -hmm. how That's they right. have adapted even when they're behind the curve, which they've tended to be. They're battle, huge battleships that they've had to Look move in response. Look how big they are. And they yeah. could use employees' ideas. Yeah. I mean, it's quite incredible. Do you so think we should apply that to the government? Uh, less of a president, but more well, of a, I, a, a, a board of directors that are taking well, that, that's easy to say. No, I'm, I'm asking the very, question. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very difficult, though. Uh, this thing you read in the papers all the time, government, the Congress is dysfunctional. It's only dysfunctional when it doesn't do what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it works beautifully <laughs> when it does what I want. Mm. And this is a nation of conflicting interests in a democracy. No one gets everything. And everyone has to sacrifice something. Right. I think we're at a time that's really critical for the United States, which is that we have all these things set up for counterbalances, which is voices get heard, which is wonderful. It doesn't happen in every country. Mm -hmm. But the quality of the conversations are not happening, and that's what I'm so upset about. And when I watch what happens and people are very polar, and all of a sudden, you but know, that's, that's because more than half the people aren't speaking. And uh, so how the, do we the create? Fewer and fewer yes. people vote. Yeah. Uh, they complain about public schools, but you're lucky if you get a 5% turnout in the, public in the school is? board elections. Why do you think that is? Because they don't really believe in democracy. Uh, mm. they, most people uh, want to be told what, they want, what, what, what to do. Uh, they don't understand it. Uh, they, they, we've given, we used to have a, a society built on deference where uh, people would defer to mm -hmm. the John Adamses and uh, the John Hancocks as more educated, better, uh, uh, more sophisticated, more worldly people. Now, Joe the plumber thinks he has the right to govern. Well, uh, given the chance, he realizes he doesn't know how to govern. Mm -hmm. So he backs off and does nothing. But he does mm -hmm. have the right to have a voice. And that's yeah. what I'd like to see, is something different happen in the way people in the political well, arena are talking to Then he's got to go to, to school and study yeah, and learn. Yeah. And, 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 uh, uh, be and, and he's got to teach his children that right. it's important exactly. to go to I totally to agree. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's the era that we're in right now. It has to be about having better conversations. Otherwise, we're going to end up having a system that is defunct. It doesn't work, even though it was yeah. set up. But on that note, since I'm the leader of this conversation, <laughs> I think it's a more important you time. Know, we we go back to me. I'm able to defer to you. Uh, yeah, that's why you should respect me. Vote for me, and uh, see. Uh, 
I read the book, so now I'm, you can all trust me to be a great leader. Conversational Intelligence by Judith Glazer was with us. Thank you for being Thank with you. us. And nothing personal. I will take it personal either. Mike Hoffitz. Yeah, uh, have you seen uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, by the way? Sorry? The oh, Wolf, yes, yes you I, have. I did see it, and I was uh, very disappointed in it. Yes. It, it had an opportunity to send a message that it failed to send. Well, thank you for being with us on Book thank du you. Jour. And uh, hello, girls. Anger, Mr. President, about George Washington and executive orders. Thank you very much for being with us thank today. You. And uh, thank you. Thank you. all really the best with the new book. And the photo is wonderful. Yep. Okay. Thank you. For sure. This episode of Books du Jour is brought to you by Picnic Market and Café.